Welcome to the first video in my three-part complete guide to water bath canning. I've been canning since I was like 10 years old. My mom, of course, was helping me back then, but now it's just a really great way to feel a little bit more resilient and use what I grow in my garden. In this video, I'll go over all the equipment that you need along with alternatives if you don't have a specific piece of equipment. I'll go over food safety guidelines, then we'll cook some jam. I've got apricot and raspberry, two different methods. And then I'll go over some frequently asked questions. Let's talk about the jars. So you have regular mouth and wide mouth and then corresponding lids for each size. These come in a really wide range of volumes. I've got 16 ounces, 32 ounces, and then eight ounces here. These are referred to as pint jars and these are referred to as quart jars. You can pick these up from the thrift store, just make sure they're not chipped at all. And it often comes up, people ask, can you use like old spaghetti cans or whatever? And that is not recommended. You wanna use jars that are intended for this purpose. The lids have kind of a rubbery seal here to make it so that this jar will be completely airtight once it is processed in our water bath. And the rings are just to keep this on during that process. You don't actually store it with the rings on. You don't want to reuse these lids. You wanna buy them fresh each time and try to only buy as much as you'll use in about a year's worth of time. If you're buying jars fresh, most of the time they come with lids and rings, so you're good there. Each lid has a flexible spot in the center that as a vacuum seal is created, kind of gets popped down. And that is one of the ways that you can tell that you have a good seal on your food. Whether you choose wide mouth or regular is totally up to you. These ones are obviously a little bit harder to get big spoons into, um, but they do kind of help keep fruit and things like that submerged under the surface of your liquid a little bit better. So kind of up to personal preference. Before we talk about pots, I realized that I forgot to mention that I am using these WEC jars throughout these canning videos. I like them for the aesthetic and a couple of other reasons. I am gonna do a video specifically about canning with these. They're a little more expensive than mason jars, um, but they do have some benefits. So keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Now we are to the water bath portion of water bath canning, and that is big pots. So. I am just gonna use this soup pot for one recipe. In case you're not ready to invest in something big like this, you can do it in this. You just have to make sure that your jars have enough room to be covered by at least an inch of water. And there has to be room for a rack or something between your jars and the very bottom of your pot. You'll see later in the video, I just used a tea towel on the bottom of the pot, which is okay. It's not the most recommended because your jars can kind of clump together. Air bubbles kind of get caught in the tea towel. So it's not the best, but it does in a pinch. But what a lot of people recommend, especially if you have something a little bit taller, like a stock pot, you can just create kind of a DIY rack out of extra rings. You can use twine or whatever you have to tie them together if you want to, or just kind of pack them in. And the reason for a rack is that you want the water to be able to circulate all around your jars. Once it really gets boiling, it you know really shakes around in there and that prevents the chances of a jar breaking as well. You don't want it to be right on the heat source. And if you wanna get really serious, you can invest in a canner. I really like this one because it has a little temperature gauge on the lid and it came with this rack that makes it really easy to put jars in and take them out. A jar lifter is the only other thing I would say is really essential. You don't wanna be sticking your hand into the hot water to lift jars out when they are done. But if you do not have a jar lifter, then you can use regular tongs and just tie some rubber bands around them and that will do the job just as well. Just be careful. The rest of these are just nice to haves, but they make a really big difference for me. So I thought I'd mention wide mouth funnel really makes a difference in not getting stuff on the counter and getting it into the jar. I have seen people use a like red solo cup with the bottom cut out to help if you don't have one of these. Something I don't have is they make these little spatulas called bubble poppers, basically a piece of plastic that also has some measurements at the top. So you can remove air bubbles and then also measure how much headspace you've got in your jar. Headspace is whatever is between the top of your food and the very top of the jar. Most of the time it's a quarter inch or a half inch of airspace that you need. And it can help to have something to accurately measure that. I just use a chopstick. To get the texture of the food just right, I use this immersion blender all the time. I use this outside of canning all the time too. 
Um, it's perfect though if you are having a hard time like mashing fruit chunks or anything like that, this is great. And a food mill makes it so easy to remove skins and seeds. If you are kind of sensitive to seeds and things, don't really like that texture, or you're making something that really requires like a perfectly smooth puree, this is awesome for that. You can, in a pinch though, use a sieve and just press it through with a spatula. And finally, there are just a couple of food additives that help you get really specific results out of your canning. So the first one is pectin. We're gonna use this in a recipe a little bit later today. It allows you to only cook the jam for about a minute but you still get it to gel up, which is awesome for preserving very fresh summer flavor. Calcium chloride, which is also known as pickle crisp. I will use this in the next video, but it basically helps vegetables keep their shape. And then pure vitamin C, ascorbic acid or citric acid. These can help preserve the color. Over time, the color of something like an apricot jam, for example, will kind of turn brown, maybe around like the six month mark, if I don't use any acid to kind of help preserve that. And then of course you need something to can, a good amount of fresh or frozen produce. You can even get free fruit by looking at fallingfruit.org or Facebook Marketplace. I have gotten loads of peaches and mulberries and blackberries from foraging or taking it off somebody's hands that has far too much than they know what to do with. Another tip I always recommend is to taste the produce before you buy it in bulk or before you just get into your canning process. The first year I canned pickles, I grew them in my backyard, but they were super bitter and I didn't realize it because I was saving them all for canning. I didn't realize it until I had like six jars of pickles that all tasted horrible. You definitely only want to use produce that is at the peak of freshness or was frozen at the peak of freshness. You don't wanna use canning as a way to kind of salvage food that's on its way out, which brings us to the next thing, which is food safety. So the reason water bath canning works and this doesn't rot in the jar is because you're creating a vacuum sealed environment where nothing can get in or out. You are processing it in heat to kill a good amount of the mold and yeast and bacteria. However, it's very difficult to kill everything. To really kill it all, you have to pressure can. So we have to make sure that the environment is inhospitable to those things by making sure that it's very acidic. And for that reason, water bath canning is really only appropriate for foods that we know are highly acidic. Tomatoes, jams, jellies, pickles, those are like the big ones. The one most people are worried about is botulism, which is a toxin that's produced by a bacteria. And what's dangerous about it is there aren't any signs. The food doesn't smell different, taste different, or really look different. The jar might have a little bit of buckling or something like that, but not always. And this is a really serious mistake to make. It can be fatal, so you don't want to mess around. In the United States, the recommendation is to only use recipes that have been tested, so not blogger recipes. Uh, that's why I'm using recipes from a tested cookbook to start with, because this is one of those things that it's very avoidable. It's very easy to not deal with food contamination if you just follow the steps. However, in the last video of this series, I am gonna go through how to make safe substitutions and alterations to recipes. You wanna start with a tested recipe for sure, but there are always gonna be little things like what if you're allergic to onions or whatever, and I want people to have the tools to be able to make substitutions or adjustments in a safe way and be smart about it instead of just having a blanket mandate that you can only use tested recipes. And you know, not everybody lives in the United States and needs to follow our rules. Let's start with the apricot jam. I'm doing half a recipe from the cookbook I showed earlier. The recipe calls for four cups of peeled, pitted, and chopped apricots. I have three pounds here, three and a half cups of sugar, and two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice. Use bottled because it has consistent acidity levels. I like to have a really smooth texture to my apricot jam, so I remove the skins by blanching. Just boil the apricots for 60 to 90 seconds, then transfer to an ice bath or run cold water over the top. The skins will come right off and you can pit and halve the apricots as you peel rather than chopping. Then transfer the apricots to a pan over medium heat along with sugar and lemon juice. Use a deep pot because the jam will spatter as it boils. Break up the fruit chunks as you stir. I came in with my immersion blender just to make that texture even smoother. Stir constantly because you don't want it to burn. 
To get the jammy texture, we're cooking it for a long time so the natural pectin in the fruit is activated and the excess water evaporates. After about 30 minutes, I tested the jamminess by dropping a teaspoon onto a frozen plate. I like my apricot jam to be a little bit runny, so this is good for me. If your recipe calls for 10 minutes of processing time or more, then you don't have to sterilize your jars by boiling them for 10 minutes, just wash them beforehand. Fill them up and wipe the edge with a clean cloth and put your lids on. Screw on the rings just until you meet resistance. Putting them on too tight can cause the jars to break from the steam pressure inside. I used a mix of jars that I had available, but this should make four or five eight ounce jars. I've had this water heating gently over the last 15 minutes because you don't want to put hot jars into cold water or vice versa. This pot is pretty shallow and I didn't have enough space for a rack plus an inch of water over the top, so I used a dish towel on the bottom. Bring it up to a boil with the lid on and then set a timer for at least 10 minutes, adding another 10 minutes for every thousand feet above sea level you are. After 10 minutes, turn off the heat and remove the lid and let it sit for five minutes. Then remove your jars and let them sit on the counter for at least 12 hours to fully seal. The center of the lid should be completely flat. After they've cooled, test the seal by removing the ring and lifting the can by the lid and shaking it just a little bit. If the seal comes off, just refrigerate or freeze the contents and use them first. Now we'll do raspberry jam with added pectin, which looks and tastes a little bit more fresh because the sugars don't caramelize. I'm using Pomona's pectin, which also allows you to use less sugar than typical pectin. A little really goes a long way here, so look up the recipes on their website and be sure to follow the directions in the box. It comes with a small packet of calcium and some larger packets of pectin. You mix two teaspoons of pectin with two cups of sugar, then mix a quarter teaspoon of calcium with a quarter cup of water. You only use a little bit of this water, so you can save the rest. Add four cups of raspberries to the pot and mash them up, then give your calcium water a little stir and mix in two teaspoons of that water with the raspberries. Heat that up until boiling, and then this goes pretty quick. Add your sugar and let it dissolve and bring everything to a boil and cook for just one minute. If I do the jam test again after this, you can see this isn't going anywhere. Similar to the other recipe, this makes four eight ounce jars. A question that comes up a lot is whether you can double jam recipes. And if you're using pectin, you're a lot more likely to be successful. It's probably going to stay syrupy with the long cook method. And I'm using my regular canner for this one, carefully lowering the hot jars into the hot water. I also added a little vinegar to the water to prevent hard water buildup on the jars. Once it's fully boiling, I start the timer for at least 10 minutes. You know the drill from here. I love the bright red color here. It's just so nice to have that fresh summer flavor in the middle of winter. You can use the cardboard flats your jars came in to store your jam in a cool dark place for 18 months. Before I move on to FAQs, I want to give you kind of a sneak peek at this book. It has a ton of great recipes and directions for all kinds of preservation, not just water bath canning. And the best part is honestly this chart at the back that has a yield conversion chart so you can know how many whole tomatoes equal seven cups of chopped tomatoes, for example. All right, let's talk FAQ. So the first one is, can I use frozen fruit or vegetables? And yes, you can, especially if you are going to be mashing it all up anyways, that's totally fine. I wouldn't use it on cucumbers or anything that you want to like hold its shape because freezing breaks down the cell walls and causes things to lose their shape and get mushy. But tomatoes, for example, I pretty much always freeze my tomatoes before canning them because it makes the process so much easier. Second is can I prepare the food one day and then can it the next? So like make the jam one day and then you realize it's 11 p.m. and it's gonna take another hour to actually can it. The answer is yes, you can, but it's generally recommended to do it all in one day if you can. So. Um, if anything, you can kind of cut and prepare your food beforehand, and then once you get cooking, ha do all that process in one go. Can I make this or that adjustment to the recipe, use low sugar, no sugar, um, anything that falls under that? Like I said, I'm gonna cover more of that in the third video, but the answer is sometimes you can, and I'm gonna leave a PDF that answers some of the common substitution questions down in the description. That can help you. If you're just starting out, I recommend trying to find recipes that are 
you know, what you can work with. And as you learn a little bit more about acidic foods versus non-acidic foods, all that, then you can confidently kind of branch out a little bit. Another big one is how can I find these USDA tested recipes without having to buy cookbooks? And a tip I have is just search Google with like the, um, edu qualifier on so like salsa canning recipes colon dot edu that will bring up stuff from universities or dot gov so what happens if a jar falls over or breaks in the pot if it falls over um, and as long as it seals just fine then you're good to go if it breaks which i think we've all had happen it's no big deal it's just messy don't try to salvage anything you don't want to accidentally ingest glass or anything just try to learn what went wrong and see how you can prevent it in the future. Even though mason jars are rated for high heat, over time, you know, just like anything, they are going to break down. So just keep that in mind. If a jar uh, seems really old or again has any chips in it, then you don't want to use that jar. If I forgot a step or something went wrong, am I totally screwed? So the answer is no, other than maybe the jar breaking and glass being a potential contaminant. If something went wrong, you do have 24 hours to reprocess. Like say you realize that you forgot the salt, then you totally can open up all those jars, reprocess it. You just, again, don't want to reuse the lids. Why are my peaches or tomatoes or whatever floating to the top of the can? This is kind of known as fruit float, and it happens because there's air trapped in the cell walls of the produce. So the solution is to break those cell walls down a little bit, either by freezing ahead of time or cooking in the brine or the syrup. That's known as hot pack versus raw pack, where you just are putting the cucumbers or whatever into the jar and then putting um, the brine over the top and processing it. If you actually cook it, then the cell walls break down and the produce is gonna be saturated with the brine. Sometimes I still do raw pack, especially for pickles, because I want them to be as crisp as possible. But if the floating thing really bothers you, then that is a way to combat that. Another big one is your tomato sauce or salsa separating. So I don't have an example of it here, but It'll be like all your salsa solids up at the top and then a bunch of clear liquid, which isn't dangerous at all. It just looks weird and feels unappetizing. You can feel free to just shake the jar up before you pour it out or use it if that happens to you. But the reason that happens is that actually when you cut tomatoes, there is an enzyme in there that starts to break down the pectin. And pectin is the natural thickener that as you cook something like tomato sauce, that's what gets it really um, rich and kind of thick and keeps those things from separating. So you wanna work a little bit quickly with tomatoes to prevent that from happening. Use the freshest tomatoes that you can and cooking with the seeds and skin in and then removing the seeds and skin with a food mill or whatever after is another way to just get the most pectin out of that batch as possible. I have at least two more videos planned for this series, so let me know if there's anything else you wanna see besides pickles and salsa. And if this video is helpful to you, then hit the like button so more people can see it. Thanks.